Welcome to AP Chemistry and General Chemistry. I'm Jeremy Krug. In this lesson, we're learning about the main types of intermolecular forces. My channel has the entire AP Chemistry course, so don't forget to hit that subscribe button. I don't want you to miss a thing. Now, as we get started talking about intermolecular forces, I'd like to take a little time to talk about the difference between intermolecular forces and intramolecular forces. Now, in this lesson, in these next few videos, we're learning about intermolecular forces that are the molecules or the forces that make molecules stick together. So we have a molecule here, a molecule here, and the force that makes them stick together, that's an intermolecular force. On the other hand, intramolecular forces are the forces that hold that molecular or that ionic compound together. So if you look at, at an actual compound, you know, the forces that are holding them together would be intramolecular forces. So that would be the covalent or the ionic bonds that we've already learned about in this uh, chemistry course. Now, intermolecular forces in this series of videos are normally going to affect the physical properties of a substance. So uh, usually we're talking about the boiling point or the melting point. There could be some other uh, properties like vapor pressure that we'll talk about later as well. On the other hand, those bonds, the covalent ionic bonds, normally affect the reactivity of the substance. Uh, generally speaking, the intermolecular forces are a little bit weaker, in fact, sometimes a lot weaker than those uh, covalent and ionic bonds, whereas intramolecular forces, covalent and ionic bonds tend to be a little bit stronger, or sometimes a lot stronger. Now, let's talk about the very first and probably the most fundamental intermolecular force. And these are London dispersion forces. Now, as we jump into this here, let's imagine an atom of neon. And when you think about neon, and of course this is not to scale, but if you look in the middle here, we have 10 protons. So we've got the 10 protons there in the middle, and then there are also 10 electrons. And we can imagine that these 10 electrons that I have represented with the 10 little red circles here are just a buzzing around the, the atom. They're in their energy levels, as we've already learned in this course. And sometimes those electrons are a little closer to the nucleus than other electrons, but they're buzzing around in that same way. Now, uh, if we figure that all electrons are evenly distributed, well, there's really no charge to speak of as far as this atom is concerned. It's all fairly evenly distributed, and it's, it's kind of a neutral atom. And this is typical. If we take a look at any atom or any compound, we can say that you know most of the time, these electrons can be fairly evenly distributed. But, like I mentioned, electrons are always buzzing around. They're always moving. And so that means that if these electrons are buzzing around, that means that at some point in time, you're going to have an electron distribution that looks more like this, where these 10 electrons at some point in time are going to be distributed on one side, or one a pole, as we can say, of the atom or of the molecule. Now, uh, if this happens, you know, we can say that that electron distribution is lopsided. And as a result, since these electrons tend to be on this side, we can call this a negative pole of the atom. And then I guess that means this other side would have to be positive because there really are not many electrons over there. Now, this type of distribution is something that we call an instantaneous uh, dipole. And basically, this is the temporary uh, lopsided distribution of electrons that can sometimes take place in an atom or a molecule. Now, if this happens to an atom, and it does sometimes, well, guess what? The fact that there's this instantaneous dipole can also affect the uh, other atoms of neon around it. So that means that we could have something like this. If this negative side and positive side is what this distribution has, well then guess what? The positive side over here can attract these electrons to that side of, of its atom and make this, this one a little bit negative as well and making that positive. So we can actually have kind of a chain reaction going on here with this, uh, which, which, which is what happens when you start out with this instant, instantaneous dipole. We can actually uh, induce a dipole, I guess, on some other atoms there. So 
what are we talking about? This, this happens, this can happen with any atom and any molecule, any substance for that matter. In fact, uh, it's safe to say that if you have a nonpolar molecule, the only major intermolecular force it has is going to be London dispersion forces. But overall, we can say everything, every atom, every molecule, every substance is going to have London dispersion forces. Now, the more electrons that a molecule has, well, the stronger that this uh, polarization can be. So we can say that the more electrons the molecule has, the more polarizable it is. And as a result, its London dispersion forces are going to be stronger as well. And guess what? Whenever you have a molecule with stronger intermolecular forces, that means its boiling point and its melting point are going to be higher as well. So we can actually tie the number of electrons that a nonpolar substance has to its boiling point and melting point, which we're going to do here in just a minute with the examples. Now, when we talk about London dispersion forces, generally speaking, those are the weakest of all the intermolecular forces. However, we can have some molecules that have so many electrons and they're so polarizable, like these very large organic molecules, for example, that have so many carbons and hydrogens that uh, they're their, their LDFs, their London dispersion forces, end up being stronger than some polar molecules. We'll, we'll see some examples of that too. So let's take a look at this first example. And the question is actually a pretty easy one. It says, which of these molecules exhibits London dispersion forces? And I don't want to say that that's a trick question. Some people might find it that way. The answer is both of them. All molecules exhibit London dispersion forces. Now, maybe we could take this one step further and say which of these two molecules is going to have the higher melting point? Well, let's say the higher uh, boiling point. Well, the one that has the higher boiling point is going to be the one that has the more has more electrons. And so if we start counting up how many electrons are in CH4 methane, it has about 10. And if we count up how many electrons are in uh, butane over here, C4H10, it's got about uh, 34 electrons. So that means that C4H10 has more electrons, it's more polarizable, and it's got the higher boiling point. And if we actually look that up, we can see that that's definitely confirmed in the laboratory. The boiling point of the methane is extremely low. I mean, pretty close to absolute zero, to be completely honest. But the boiling point of butane I mean, about negative one degree Celsius. And so the more electrons something has, the higher its boiling point is going to be because the more polarizable it is. Its London dispersion forces are stronger. Now, let's try this exercise here. Let's rank these nonpolar molecules in order of increasing boiling point. So since they're nonpolar, that means that the only uh, intermolecular force they have will be London dispersion forces. So the one that's lowest is going to be the one that has the fewest electrons. Now which one is that? Well that would be helium, wouldn't it? It's only got two electrons. That's the lowest. And then what's next? Well argon has about 18 electrons, doesn't it? So that's the, the next, the one in the middle. And that means that propane, C3H8, has got to be the highest because it's got, what is that, about uh, 26 um, electrons or so. And so that's the, that's the rank. And if we compare this to what we actually find in the laboratory, look at that. Helium has got an extremely low boiling point. Argon's still pretty low. And uh, propane's pretty low too, but it actually is the highest of all three of those. So there we have London dispersion forces. Everything has them. Some have more than others. Let's take a look at a second uh, type of intermolecular force, and that's something called a dipole-dipole force. And dipole-dipole forces uh, can be visualized when we have, let's say, a molecule of hydrogen chloride, HCl. So here is a not-to-scale uh, molecule here, or a visualization of that. And we know that chlorine has a much higher electronegativity than hydrogen does as we've already learned in this course. That means that there is a lopsided electron distribution here as well. 
And that's going to make this a polar molecule, as we've already learned in this course. So that means that we're going to have a partial negative charge over here on this side of the molecule. And that's what this little delta negative means. And then we have a partial positive charge on this side of the molecule with that little delta positive. And that's what happens when you have a polar molecule. There's a lopsided charge distribution. One side's negative and one side's positive. Now, as a result, when you have a bunch of these molecules sitting next to each other, well, we can have attractions there. And so if we look at all of these HCLs here, well, guess what? This positive part of this molecule is going to have a fairly strong attraction to the negative side of its neighboring molecule. And that's a dipole-dipole force. And the same thing over here. The negative part of this molecule is going to have an attraction to the positive side of this molecule over here. So I can make a little line there, a dotted line there showing that's a dipole-dipole force. And so that's what you have. In a dipole-dipole force, you have to have polar molecules. That's what we we're talking about when we say polarity of the molecule. So let's try this uh, little summary here. Like I said, only polar molecules have the dipole-dipole forces. Now, they also have London dispersion forces. Now, don't forget about that. Everything has London dispersion, but they also have dipole-dipole. Usually those dipole-dipole forces are stronger than the dispersion forces. Uh, and everything else being equal, if you have two structures with approximately the same number of electrons, we would suspect that the polar molecule, because of its dipole-dipole force, will have the higher boiling point than the nonpolar molecule that's just got London dispersion forces. So let, let's try this uh, example here. Which of these molecules has the higher boiling point? So once again, we have two molecules here. Uh, and when we have something with you know, carbon and hydrogen just by itself, we can pretty much uh, say that that's going to be a nonpolar molecule. So it just has London dispersion forces. But generally speaking, something with nitrogen, uh, especially with a halogen, is pretty much always going to be polar, isn't it? So that's a polar molecule. And so we're, we can say that the polar molecule is going to have the higher boiling point. because It's got dipole-dipole forces whereas the, the butane does not. And if we look that up, we can say that definitely that's the case. The boiling point of the nitrogen trichloride is a whole lot higher. I mean, 71 degrees Celsius is a whole lot higher than the boiling point of the butane, that negative one degree Celsius. Well, I hope you learned something about London dispersion forces and dipole-dipole forces in this video. This can be kind of a tough subject as you've already had to learn something and have to know something about uh, molecular structure and how to draw these out. So I hope you, you learned something about how to apply those in this video. If you did learn something from this video, if you'd be so kind as to smash that like button, I'd really appreciate it. That way, YouTube recommends my videos to other chemistry students. I've been teaching AP Chemistry for multiple decades, and I want you to get a five on your AP exam and make an A in your class. I'm Jeremy Krug. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you again on my channel where we can learn some more chemistry together.